If you had one of your worst gardens on record, whether it's from never-ending rains to the pests moving in to it seeming like your garden just kind of gave up, well, good news is that the wintertime is one of the best times to actually recharge your garden in regards to its soil. So today's video, we're going to look at what you can do now here before the snow really flies in your garden to help it overcome all of these issues before next year. We're talking pests, drainage, weeds, nutrient issues, all of it. So if you don't know who I am, my name is Ashley and I have a bachelor's of science in soil science. I've worked in the world of agriculture for about 15 years. I've been gardening since I was five years old. And I like to take all of this life experience and apply it to my garden. And in today's video, we are going to talk about the five main reasons your garden was suffering and how you can fix it over these winter months. Excessive levels of rain can cause one thing in particular, and that is compacted soil, which sounds odd, but it's completely true. Now, the reality is that compacted soil is not a good thing. There's a study done in 2005 that actually showed compacted soil could restrict root growth anywhere from 30 to 70 percent, which is quite shocking and will definitely cause nutrient deficiencies and poor performance, hands down. So one thing that you need to look at if you had a high precipitation year is to look at whether or not the soil itself is compacted to the extent that it's bad. So one way to do this is to very simply take a clothes hanger, a stake, anything, and push it into the soil. If it doesn't go in like butter, then that is your sign that you do have compacted soil. And the fix for this is relatively simple. You could till it if it is really excessive and it's something that you've been battling for an extended period of time. You could also very simply put a layer of organic material on top, whether that's leaves, compost, manures, and this will actually help with bulking of the soil or the soil structure in general. And your other option would be to mark down that bed as the bed in which you want to grow your beets, your carrots, that sort of thing next year, your potatoes, because those plants will either force you to dig and fluff the soil from beneath and or will fracture the soil vertically and horizontally, which will in turn break up that compaction, which will allow roots to move into the space, water, and that over time will re-aggregate that soil into clumps, which are completely normal, by the way. This next one I feel like doesn't get enough attention, despite the fact that it has a pretty major effect on the nutrients within your soil, the cycling of that nutrients, the health of your roots, and it can be caused by so many different things that it is almost inevitable to happen at some point in your gardening journey. And that is the destruction or the die-off of your microbial diversity or your microbes altogether. So the first question becomes, how do you wipe out your microbial diversity? And there's a number of different ways to do this, but some main ways to do it is via too much fertilization, organic or synthetic. It could also be caused by anaerobic soil, which is caused by excessive levels of rain. Another thing could have been a pesticide or a fungicide that was used, organic or synthetic, conventional, and it affecting your microbes of a certain profile, if you will. So in order to replenish this, and something you should do pretty much regardless of whether or not you had any of these issues, is through an increase of carbon. So in 2008, there was actually a study looking at how to replenish the microbes within your soil, and they looked at specifically just the additions of carbon. And even with the addition of carbon, it took several months for that microbe diversity or number to actually get back up to what it was at previously. So one of the best ways to actually go about reestablishing their homes is through the addition of compost and manures, and then obviously a layer of mulch. This is going to do a couple things. It's going to keep that compost manure layer warmer later into the season. It also is going to help to retain moisture, which is something that microbes love and adore. Another thing you could do is actually incorporate the compost or manure into your topsoil. And whenever doing this, the key is always going to be diversity. So the more sources of compost you can find, the better. The more sources of manure you can find, the better. Because everything is going to have a slightly different microbe profile 
depending on what it's made up of. A vegetable compost made by tomato leaves versus a vegetable compost made by corn stalks are two very different end results. Okay, so the next one is actually a little sneaky. And that is the overwintering of pathogens and pests. So one way that pathogens and pests are overwintered in our soil or in our compost is solely because there's plant debris that is left behind that didn't get hot enough or didn't get cold enough to actually stop that pathogen. Or it's fungi-based, soil-borne fungi-based, which in turn means that these spores are indestructible because that is what fungi is, indestructible. So for example, things like reticulum or fusarium, both of which are harmful to your plants and have a pretty broad sweeping host plant range that they can take advantage of. And the crazy part is, is that these can survive in your soil, your debris, anywhere from three to five years, which is a lot. Okay, so the fix to this, I think I've mentioned a million times, is the removal of your debris in your gardens. So removing the old plant debris, the mulches, anything that exists, and then composting them and or throwing them out if it's a fungal issue. There is another method, though, that I haven't discussed too much, partially because I'm slightly hesitant because there is some nuance to this whole concept, but it is biofumigants. So biofumigants are very specific types of plants, usually in the brassicae family, such as mustard or radish. And they release something called glucocyanates. And these will suppress the fungal growth for a number of different reasons. So remember how I've told you with powdery mildew, things like sulfur can actually help to reduce this in your garden or to prevent it in some capacity. Well, sulfur is something that is very high in the brassicae family, in the plant debris, in the root, all of it. So bios are a way in which you can naturally get excessive levels of compound that many fungal pr problems you see with plants cannot withstand. The other one that you could do is solarization. I've beaten this word dead, but it is definitely something you can consider right now before the snow hits and or in the spring. Now we all understand the concept that when we remove plants from the garden, we are removing the nutrients that made that plant exist. Obvious. The one nutrient that we oftentimes don't think about, and that's solely because it's not a primary macro, it's not a secondary macro, and it's not a micronutrient. It is literally a fundamental nutrient, and that is carbon. So when we go to harvest our plants, we are removing carbon, and this can be decreased by 0.1 to 0.2% per year. So over a period of 10 or so years, you so depending on how high you actually put your density in of plants, you can lose somewhere between 1%, 1 to 2% of your organic carbon in 5 to 10-year range. What this means is that you have a substantial reduction in the cation exchange capacity, which is essentially, essentially the soil's ability to hold on to nutrients. And you also are reducing the water holding capacity of your soil, which makes the soil system as a whole less resistant to things like drought. And we're not talking by a little bit. A 1% increase or decrease in carbon can change the water holding capacity to the tune of 20,000 liters per hectare. That's a lot. Sorry, I wasn't even hectare. I mathed that wrong. Acre per acre. Although hectare is a farming term more so than a gardening term. That's why I use that because that's my, my norm for calculating anything. Hectares. The geek crew farmers, they know what I'm talking about. So it goes without saying that every single growing season leaves a fingerprint on your garden. And you can choose to erase that fingerprint or leave it in the event that you had a poor year or maybe just a few beds that were acting a little bit goofy. Right now is the time to actually reclaim that and make it work to your benefit the following year. Get you have to let me know in the comments down below what your garden struggled with and what you think performed really well this year and why. I will talk to you guys next time.